Revelation chapter 19. This is what all of our time spent in the book of Revelation has been for. This is the revealing of Jesus Christ. And especially in this section, we get to uh, witness him in all of his power, in all of his glory. Um, And he, yeah, it's incredible. So I'm not going to say any more about that. I'll pray for us, and then we will, um, (laughs) actually, I'm going to say quite a bit more about that, actually, as we make make our time through our, our passage here. But I won't spend any more time on introduction. I will pray, and then we will get in. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of worship this morning, and that um, along with our passage, we got to reflect on on your names. We got to reflect on your position as the God of of angel armies and and the the uh, commander-in-chief of all of heaven, and we... um, Lord, I, I just pray that as we uh, see you in all of your glory this morning, that it would fill our hearts with awe, with wonder, with praise and worship. And may we just be humbled in your presence as we see your great power on display uh, simply in your countenance. And I, yeah. Thank you for this great day that we get to uh, get kind of a sneak preview and then look forward to experiencing it uh, in the first person, in real time. And give us hearts of expectation as we uh, look forward to this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week uh, we were, and if you haven't been with us, our study in the book of Revelation has actually been... um, incredible i well i hope it's been incredible for you all it has been incredible for me but anyways if you would like to catch up um all of our sermons are archived on our on our website or you can follow us our on our youtube channel as well you can find those there but just to give you just kind of a brief and uh catch up last week we were able to attend the grand praise and worship service in heaven as chapter 19 opens up we we read of the great and glorious shouts of acclamation that fill the lungs of the inhabitants of heaven. And this praise, of course, comes as an acknowledgement of God's true and righteous judgments, we read, and that he is the true source of salvation. He is also the source of glory and honor and power, and these attributes all belong to him, and he is worthy to be praised. As Warren Wiersbe declares, The song emphasizes God's attributes, which is the proper way to honor him. We do not rejoice at the sinfulness of Babylon or even the greatness of Babylon's fall. We rejoice that God is true and righteous and that he is glorified by his holy judgments. As we have been reading through kind of the bulk of the middle of Revelation gives us a picture into Satan and his false system that he sets up and and how evil it is and how he's just d- decided to take over the world as this as this one as this yeah one world leader and ruler and it's it might be easy to be and we are glad for it that that God is going to rule in righteousness and and in his truth um, execute judgment but what we ought to be more focused on and more impressed with is God's righteousness God's power God's glory and that's what Warren Rearsby is is encouraging us to do is the downfall of Babylon great yes but the exaltation of God and the exaltation of Jesus is greater and we ought to be more thankful for that. The praise and worship then gives way to a wedding. We see a wedding that we, uh, we discover that we ourselves will be attending as the bride of Christ, the church, clean and bright, 
dressed in the righteousness of Christ, adorned in his glory and salvation and entering into this intimate relationship with him for eternity. And we close by noticing that all eyes are on Jesus at this point. As we continue to read in chapter 19, we will see him described in all of his glory, highly exalted and greatly to be praised. And so that's where we pick it up in verse 11. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To give you the roadmap this morning, first we're going to be looking at the King appears from heaven in verses 11 through 13, looking at essentially the climax of the book of Revelation, that this is what it has been building to, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and here he is. We're going to be looking at how Jesus has come to take possession of what he has rightly purchased. And then um, we're going to be seeing how this has this moment has been declared earlier in Scripture, both by the prophets and by Jesus himself. We'll be looking at Jesus' description and his names. Then we'll be looking at the king's army in verse 14. And then we'll be looking at the king's armament and title, looking at how he carries a sword, how he carries a rod, and the wine press, and his title as king supreme. We are now transitioning in the record, and I mentioned last week that there's kind of five events that are mapped out in these closing chapters of the book. And we're so we're moving from the first event of the marriage supper of the Lamb to now the literal and physical return of our Lord Jesus Christ, his second coming. This indeed, what we see laid out for us in these verses, is our coming king. And here we see Jesus taking possession of that which he has already purchased on the cross. David Gusick notes there is a sense in which everything before before this in the book of Revelation is an introduction to this revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Now he returns to earth in power and glory. And I wanted to just note and make a distinction here while we are here and while we are looking at this, that there is a difference between Jesus' second coming, this event that we see noted here in Revelation 19, and the rapture of the church. They are not the same event. If, you, if we read um, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, um, in verse uh, 13, where Paul begins to, to, to describe the rapture of the church and, and this event that will take place where we are caught up to heaven to be with the Lord, he writes, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus." For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. 
we did a, a, a much more in-depth study on the subject of the rapture, uh, specifically looking at Revelation chapter 4. That was quite a while ago now, but it's important to make this distinction, and, and I think the distinction is easy to find because what we see here described is, the, is Jesus coming back with this procession from heaven versus the rapture that is described for us in 1 Thessalonians 4, where the believers are on the earth, and we go to meet Jesus in the air. It doesn't really make sense that we would go and then just immediately come back. And then, so then that gives for us kind of an, uh, a window into the timeline of things, that the rapture occurs first, we, we are in heaven with Jesus for this period of the tribulation, and then when it's time to close when it's time for Jesus to take his rightful place as the king of the earth, he returns, and we return with him. This is the revealing of Jesus Christ. This is the day that we that all will see him. He will be revealed as he truly is, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And what is he doing? He is coming to take possession of that which is rightly his. In chapter 5 of Revelation, we, we read of the Lamb opening the scroll, which some believe to be the title deed of the earth. And now he comes to lay claim to that which was given to him. The declaration that was made in uh, Revelation chapter 11 now comes to fruition. In Revelation 11, 15 through 18, we read, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. There is a sense that as we read through this, and as we read of these sections that look forward to what we see take place here, that this is what essentially all of creation is longing for. This is what we've all been waiting for, and this is what feels right. And of course it is right. Because Jesus is the one who is the creator of all things. He's the one, the, the one who owns all things. And therefore, when he takes possession of it, it makes all things right. They are put in their rightful place. Continuing in verse 18 of, of chapter 11, we read, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And so that's kind of a moment that has been foreshadowed, a moment that we've been waiting for, this moment that we see here in chapter 9 throughout Revelation, throughout our study in Revelation. And in fact, this moment has been declared throughout Scripture and could possibly be one of the oldest prophecies declared by a man of God in Scripture. Enoch was, was kind of a, he was a prophet in his day. If you want to read about Enoch in, in Genesis, in the um, genealogy of, of Noah, he's in there. But in Jude, the, the one chapter, short book of Jude, we get a little bit of insight into this man Enoch, who um, we read in verses 14 and 15 about this prophecy that he was declaring to the world during his day. In verse 14 we read, Now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so this day has been declared from the beginning, from the days of old, like way back old. And we also see that Jesus is carrying out 
exactly what he declared he would do. When he is when he's being interrogated by the Sanhedrin in Mark chapter 14, he's on trial, he's been falsely arrested. They're doing this this night interrogation of Jesus and they ask him this question in Mark chapter 14 verse 61. Again the high priest asked him saying to him, "Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed?" And Jesus said, "I am." And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus said this is going to happen. And here we are reading it take place. This is the day, the hour, the moment that the earth has been groaning for. This is the day that those who long for his appearing have been anticipating. And this is the day that Jesus himself has earned and has waited for patiently. And now it comes about. Heaven is opened, the gates break forth, and in might and power the ruler of heaven and earth comes forth on a white horse. He is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His title is familiar from the beginning portions of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, on this subject, Joseph Seiss comments, In the letter to the Laodiceans, he was the faithful and true witness, reproving and instructing his friends. Here, he is the faithful and true warrior and judge for the punishment of his enemies. So the fact that he is faithful and true is good news for those who are his, you and I, the believers in Christ. It's bad news for those who are against him. Just to give you a couple definitions of the, of the word faithful, it is, it is defined as steadfast in affection or allegiance, loyal or firm in adherence to promises or an observance of duty. So I think Jesus fits the bill there. He is going to observe the duty that has been given to him. He's going to carry it out faithfully. Uh, the definition of true in accordance with fact or reality it, without deviation or the quality or state of being accurate as in alignment or adjustment. David Gusick comments, faithful and true, this glorious title shows Jesus is the keeper of promises, including his promises of judgment. Chuck Missler takes truth and defines it in the context of just Jesus being the definition of truth. He writes, Definition of truth, when the word and the deed become one. God's word, as it was uttered to Adam in the garden, that he would bring forth a deliverer that would redeem mankind, became truth when Jesus Christ was born into a manger, went through his ministry, and went in obedience to the cross on your behalf and mine. He is the truth. And of course, we read of this in John 14, verse 6, where Jesus himself declares that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Moving into verse 12, we see a description of Jesus along with two of his names. We read, his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. It was cool singing the Thousand Names song today because it just gives us a window into what we see here. It's like, yeah, Jesus has this name that no one knows. Oh, by the way, he's also called the Word of God. Oh, by the way, he's also called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we see it played out for us here that Jesus is a man of many names. And he is deserving of every single one. This description is familiar to us of Jesus, his eyes being like a flame of fire from, from his first appearance in the book of Revelation. In, in verse 14, we read that his eyes are like a flame of fire. And we looked into why this would be. Why would he be described this way? And I think that it points to the fact that his eyes are... His vision is cutting. It's burning. It, he looks deep inside through all of any wall that we could ever put up or any sort of excuse we could ever make, it, Jesus cuts through all of it. And he sees our inmost being, even beyond what we can even reveal. Jesus sees that. 
and it cut, he cuts to the deepest point. Charles Spurgeon writes, why are they like flames of fire? Why first to, define, to discern the secrets of all hearts? There are no secrets here that Christ does not see. There is no lewd thought. There is no unbelieving skepticism that Christ does not read. There is no hypocrisy, nor, no formalism, no deceit that he does not scan as easily as a man reads a page in a book. His eyes are like a flame of fire to read us through and through and know us to our inmost soul. And it would make sense here that his eyes are like a flame of fire because he is coming to judge his enemies. We are going to see, as we continue in our study, the, the armies of, of, of Satan gather together in the, in the valley of, of Megiddo, and they're ready to do war against God and against his Christ. And so Jesus coming with his eyes of flame of fire, scanning his enemies. All he sees is evil deeds. All he sees is evil men. All he sees is rebellion. And all they see are the eyes of judgment of Jesus, his righteous and true judgment. And along with his flaming eyes, we see that Jesus is wearing many crowns in verse 12. And it's important to make a distinction here between the writer of chapter 6 that we see in Jesus' description here in verse 9. That writer is given many crowns as well, but they are uh, in the Greek called the Stephanos, and they're the, the victor's crown, or what, what would be crowned upon the winner of, of the Olympic Games back in that time. And so you have this leafy crown that that writer is wearing in chapter 6, versus what we have here described for us is what is called diadem in the Greek, or a crown of royalty or authority. If you think of it this way, a king's crown. And, you, and so we have kind of this contrast, this leafy crown for the writer in, in chapter 6, who we believe to be the Antichrist, and it, signal, it signifies his rule, his reign is temporary. It will come to an end versus the crowns that Jesus is crowned with, the royal diadem, he is made of gold or, or precious metal, and therefore signifying that his rule, his reign, is meant to last. David Gusick writes, the fact that there are many crowns means that Jesus is the ultimate in royal authority and power. It is a visible manifestation of what we mean when we say king of kings. It is an expression of unlimited sovereignty. Charles Spurgeon writes, I pause here, overcome by the majesty of the subject. And instead of attempting to describe that brow and those glittering crowns, I shall act the part of a seraph and bow before that well-crowned head and cry, Holy, 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 art thou, Lord God of hosts. The keys of heaven and death and hell hang at thy girdle. Thou art supreme, and unto thee be glory forever and ever. And along with his many crowns, we see that he is wearing a robe dipped in blood. This harkens back to chapter 14, where we see the reaping of the grapes of wrath in, in verses 19 and 20. It reads in, in Revelation 14, 19, So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great, great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs giving us kind of a sneak preview into the battle. It's not really a battle, the one-sided victory of King Jesus that is to come. This speaks of Jesus crushing his enemies, crushing the rebellion, and trampling underfoot all who would oppose him. In Psalm 110, David predicted this day and looked forward to its fulfillment. Psalm 110, it's only seven verses, David writes, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. 
The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. I want to encourage you, in this, because like thinking of Jesus in this way it might make you uh, uncomfortable, but this is who Jesus is, has always truly been the commander-in-chief, the Lord of all, the great victor. And, and in his graciousness, he came to the earth as a man that we may know him. And he came humbly in the form of a servant, right? Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2. But here we see him as he truly is, exalted, glorified, victorious, the greatest warrior who has ever been or ever will be. Notice his robe is not dipped in his own blood, but the blood of his enemies. And this is revealed to us in, in Isaiah chapter 63. In Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, Isaiah prophesies of this moment. Who is this who comes from Edom, who dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, speak in right, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have tr trod in the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. So Jesus is victorious. Jesus is king. Moving on to his names, we see that he is given a name that no one knows but himself. And he is also called the Word of God. Warren Risby has a short and sweet commentary on Jesus' special name, stating perhaps the secret name in verse 12 is the name is the same as the new name that is spoken of in Revelation 3.12. Not knowing what this name is, we cannot comment on it, but it is exciting to know that even in heaven we shall learn new things about our Lord Jesus. I don't think much more can be said on that subject other than Jesus is deserving of such a name, such a title, a name that is higher than our understanding or even our own comprehension, the name which is above every name. He is also called the Word of God, which should be a familiar title to us. Jesus is called this by this name in John's Gospel, the opening chapter of, of, of John's Gospel. He declares Jesus to be the Word of God made flesh. In verse 14, John writes, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in verse 18, John writes, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus is the living and breathing Word of God. Without Jesus, we could not comprehend the message of the Father. We could not even know who God is without Jesus coming for us. Or we would not even know the great love of the Father without Jesus. Because we, as we know, the the Hopefully, the verse that you all have memorized, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son as a declaration of his love. That's what the father did. He sent his son that we might know that he loves us. And it is through Jesus that he has made these things known, his great love for us, his salvation. 
His grace, all of it, is made known through Jesus. Warren Wiersbe writes, The Word of God is one of the familiar names of our Lord in Scripture. Just as we reveal our minds and hearts to others by our words, so the Father reveals himself to us through his Son, the incarnate Word. A word is made up of letters, and Jesus Christ is Alpha and Omega. He is the divine alphabet of God's revelation to us. I think we've spent a considerable amount of time on verses 11 through 13, so we better move on to verse 14. We read, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Similar in description to those we have seen previously in this chapter who are seated and present in heaven. They are clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and follow Jesus also riding on white horses. Something to be noted is what they're not wearing, the armies of heaven. They're not clothed in armor, dressed for battle. They're just clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Why is this? Because Jesus is the only one who's going to be doing any fighting. We're just there to witness the greatness of, of Jesus, the greatness of his victory. And so there is no armament needed for Christ's army. He alone will be doing the fighting, and he alone will claim victory. There is some scholarly discussion as to exactly who makes up this heavenly army. Is it angels? Is it the saints? I think the answer can safely be asserted as both. Jesus is the commander of the army of the Lord. We, he's revealed with this title in Joshua chapter 5, verse 14. Whoever falls under him answers to his leadership, whether it be men or angels. Chuck Missler writes, what I can't figure out is what the armies are for. There is no struggle, no battle of Armageddon, a word of his mouth, and his enemies are over. I think in kind of contemplating what the purpose of the armies being present would be, I think the answer could simply be to bear witness to the great and mighty power of our great king. We are the audience, and we will stand in awe at the complete and total victory of King Jesus. And in mention of that victory, we move on to see the tools that Christ will wield as, and the ultimate title that he will hold in verses 15 and 16. It says, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress wine of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I think just to give you the symbolism here, he has given a sword symbolizing that Jesus is the conqueror. He is the one who will be conquering and victorious. He has given a rod or a scepter signifying that he will become the ruler, and we will see and read of his reign, his thousand, the thousand year reign of Christ to come on the earth. We also read of the wine press, which I think signifies Jesus' position as judge, that it is by the standard of Jesus that all men are to be judged before the throne of God in heaven. And then in his title, we see him as King Supreme. He is the highly exalted, the highest exalted one. The sword we see here is the word of God. Jesus is God. The sword of his word goes forth from his mouth and will be the source of his victory. God's word is compared to a sword multiple times throughout Scripture. Isaiah chapter 49, Psalm 149, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Hebrews 4.12, Ephesians chapter 6, Revelation 1.16, Revelation 2.16. Here in... Um, chapter 19, where we read it here, and then also in verse 21 as well. The sword here speaks of Jesus as the conqueror. He will be victorious over his enemies, and he will do so by the word of his mouth. 2 Thessalonians 2.8, then the lawless one who will, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. 
Along with that, the description of the rod. We are told that Jesus will rule the nations. Psalm chapter 2 declares the rulership of Jesus in verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And we have seen Jesus' rulership foreshadowed and foretold previously in Revelation. It's been something that the whole book has looked forward to. Revelation 2.27, he will rule them with a rod of iron as when, earth, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. Revelation 12.5, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. He will then be instituted as ruler of, over all the earth, as we will later see in Revelation 20, showing every king, every president, every man who has ever held position of power, just how it's done. Jesus will be the perfect king, the perfect ruler, and he will reign in perfection for a thousand years on the earth. We also see that he himself treads the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God, I think a symbol of his judgment at Armageddon. We already kind of touched on that, so we won't spend any more time on that. And then verse 16 closes with his ultimate title, declaring Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no one higher, no one greater. Jesus has earned this position and is worthy of the title. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To close this morning, I wanted to share with you a a brief clip. It's about five minutes from Dr. David Reagan, but his excitement and how he describes the events, he kind of does an overview of Revelation in five minutes, which is probably it could arguably the most be the most impressive part of the of the the video but i i'm so encouraged by his excitement by his description of what's to come and i wanted to share it with you and maybe familiar because i think we have we have gone over this as a church if it's not um yeah i'm just going to hand it over to, to dr david reagan to close out our time this morning living on borrowed time because the fulfillment of these prophecies indicate that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. One final thing. What is the message of Israel in prophecy for you and me? What is the significance of it for the church? I would contend that it proves that God is faithful to keep all of his promises and that it is a very important message for the church, a very important one, because God has made a lot of promises to me. Folks, he's made a lot of promises to us. And because I see him fulfilling these promises to Jews, I know he's going to fulfill every promise that he has made to you and me, to his church. He has promised that one day soon, very soon, the church age is going to come to an end, going to come to a halt. And when that happens, when Jesus appears in the heavens and takes us out of here in the rapture of the church, there's going to be seven years of unparalleled horror here upon this earth, the seven years of the tribulation. And during that time, we're going to be in heaven being judged of our works, not to determine our eternal destiny, but to determine our degrees of reward. And after all the rewards have been handed out, we're going to sit down with Jesus at the greatest feast the cosmos has ever seen. And we're going to celebrate our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he finishes, let me tell you what's going to happen. He's going to stand up and say, let's go. And he's going to break from the heavens and we are coming with him. I don't know if you ever realized that before. It says in the book of Revelation that those to whom those rewards are given are going to come with him. We will come with Jesus at the second coming. We will come with him in our glorified bodies, hundreds of millions of glorified saints. And I think that we're going to be hovering in the sky and filling the Kidron Valley when he comes to the Mount of Olives and his foot touches that mountain and it splits in half. And he speaks that supernatural word. And the Antichrist and his forces are destroyed just like that. There is no battle of Armageddon. He just speaks a word and they're destroyed. Once before he did this, once before, 
He came to the Mount of Olives, but that time it wasn't on a white war charger, the symbol of a victorious general. It was on a donkey. And he rode down in the Kidron Valley, which was filled with thousands of people who had heard of his resurrection of Lazarus. And as he rode down that Kidron Valley, they waved palm branches and they put cloaks on the ground and they shouted, Hosanna, the son of David, Hosanna, the son of God. And a week later, they were shouting, crucify, crucify. I think Jesus is going to replay that day in his life. He's going to come back on that great white war charger and he's going to ride down in that valley and hundreds of millions of glorified saints are going to be in the valley in the sky above. And I think we're going to be singing Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna. Every time I sing a song that has the word Hosanna in it, I get cold chills all over me because I know I'm just preparing for that day. We're going to see him ride down that valley, right up to that eastern gate. Read Psalm 24. It tells what's going to happen. As he approaches that gate, it says the gate will blow open. It's the only gate of Jerusalem that's sealed. And that was prophesied in in Ezekiel 44, and he's going to blow up, and, and the gate's going to say, come on in, you king of glory, come on in, and be coronated the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we will see that, and we will see him as he begins to reign in glory and majesty over all the world during the 1,000 years of the millennial reign. And at the end of that reign, I think we're going to be taken off this earth, and we're going to be put in that new Jerusalem that he's preparing right now. And from the viewpoint of that new Jerusalem, I think we're going to see the greatest fireworks display in all of history as this earth is consumed with fire to burn away the pollution of Satan's last revolt and replaced by a new earth, an eternal earth. And then we're going to be lowered down in that new Jerusalem in our glorified bodies down to that new earth. And we're going to live on that new earth eternally in our glorified bodies in the presence of God. It says we will serve him. It says we will see his face. No one has ever seen the face of God. It says we will see his face, which I think is an indication that we're going to have intimate relationship with our creator eternally. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. Jesus is the hope of Israel. Jesus is the hope of the church. And Jesus is the world's only hope. One day, he's returning to the Mount of Olives. And in this picture, painted by a Messianic Jew in Jerusalem, he will stand on that Mount of Olives, and the Jewish people will come out of Jerusalem and bow before him and receive him as Messiah, and they will cry out, Baruch Abba, Bashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And until that day happens, I just get up every morning, look at the sky, and cry out from the depths of my heart, Maranatha, 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 come quickly, Lord Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your great and precious promises that you have given to us in your word. And Lord, I, I do thank you that you have given us um, not only a revelation of things to come, but you've given us a record of, of things that you have brought to be. And we can take confidence in the things to come because of how you have declared things in the past and then brought them about and given them to us as, as confidence that, hey, what I have done in the past is, is for your encouragement that you can take to the bank the promises I have for you in the future. And so I thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that as we take in these magnificent scenes, these scenes that are almost unfathomable to, our, to, to my human comprehension, Lord, give us Give us that, that faith that Sam was talking about, that faith that, that, that believes, that trusts, that takes hold of these great and precious promises. Thank you that you are going to be victorious. Thank you that you make us victorious over sin and death. Now you will make us victorious on into eternity. And we look forward to your exaltation and our exaltation with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today is the first Sunday of the month, and, and